Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, after having sat in the back for the uh, country reports, I think I can be clear to say that what I'm about to show you is something completely different. Um, what I wanted to do was give an impression of some of the technology that's available uh, when we're looking for specific sites. I represent a manufacturer of uh, LiDAR equipment and many of you may have used our terrestrial LiDAR equipment to scan inside and outside of uh, historical or heritage sites. Uh, a colleague uh, will speak in a moment about the actual use of this in, in anger in the field, but I'd like to give you a bit of an overview of the technologies that are available. The laser point clouds or, or LiDAR point clouds are three-dimensionally correct points with a perfect or accurate X, Y, and Z position. So similar to how you would use a total station on an archaeological site, or perhaps the laser scanners, the terrestrial laser scanners, we can do the same thing from airborne cameras or airborne LiDAR. So I want to talk a little bit about the differences between the uh, results that you get from a, an airborne camera, a digital airborne camera, and a airborne laser or airborne LiDAR. The first technology extracts points from the pixels that are collected when you take a digital aerial photograph. The technique is called semi-global matching or SGM and it was uh, researched in the uh, latter part of the, the century and correctly produced by Hirschmuller of the, uh, the German Aerospace Research Centre. What happens here is that overlapping images, overlapping digital camera images are correlated to extract a point from each pixel on the image. So similar to a laser scanner point, we get a dimensionally correct XYZ coordinate for each pixel in each image. So as we fly along over the uh, topography, over the forest, over the land, over the buildings, we can take images and from that extract points which can then be used uh, for various uh, applications. The other way of doing it is similar to ter terrestrial laser scanning or terrestrial LiDAR. So in this case we have a, a, an active system where we have a laser on board a helicopter or on board a, an aircraft and it flies over the, the area to be surveyed and we get again a point for each uh, point that was fired. Each time the laser was fired we get a point. And these points are millions, millions and billions of points. And it's this uh, vast quantity of data that allows some of the applications uh, that we have to be used. A comparison between, uh, on the center there, the LiDAR is the active system. You can fire it from an aircraft, from a sensor that's in an aircraft, or on the other side, we can use an ADS or a frame camera, a digital camera, to collect the data. And you can see the resolution uh, and the points per square meter. By and large, the more points, the better, because that's where you'll see the nuances on the topography or the digital surface model, which is created from all of this information. If we look here at, at a comparison uh, on one area of Switzerland, Romanshorn, uh, a little town uh, in northeastern uh, Switzerland, on the left hand side from the image correlation, the SGM, we have the possibility to get around 350 points per meter square. So that's 350 dimensionally correct accurate points per square meter surveyed on the ground. On the right hand side is the LiDAR, so you can see it straight away that the airborne LiDAR has a, a slight deficit in terms of picking up the number of points per square meter possible. So more uh, resolution or more data comes from the image-based semi-global mapping. Here is an example of the profiles across the topography. In fact, it's a building and some uh, vegetation on the left of the slide and on the right hand side, uh, some trees. So the, the light color, the light blue, is actually from the 
images, the semi-global matching, and the dark blue points that you can see are from the LiDAR. So you can see that the blue has a lot more points, the light blue has a lot more points, but the shape of the terrain or the buildings is similar from both. But what you do see, and let's see if I can... Over here, you can actually see that this is the top of the tree canopy that has been captured by the airborne camera and the airborne LiDAR. But underneath, the only points that come through are the ones from the LiDAR. And this is one of the main advantages of airborne LiDAR over images. Images can only see the top of the building or the top of the forest or the top of the vegetation. Whereas with the LiDAR, there is a good chance, a high probability that points will be captured underneath the, the tree canopy. And that will give you the uh, terrain or it will reveal to you the items or artifacts that you're looking for in the areas. So following slides are some of the typical outputs from the, the imagery, from the semi-global matching. And these are generally termed digital surface models. Uh, the difference between a digital surface model and a digital terrain model is that the surface model includes all of the man-made um, items such as buildings and, and so forth, whereas the terrain model has all of that stripped away so that it gives you the bare terrain which can then be used for contouring and, and so forth that you may be uh, familiar with. So here it is possible to see from the air that we've been able to capture with the, uh, the imagery the tops of buildings. Now many techniques for surveying will survey the inside of a building or the, the topography from ground level, but it's sometimes very difficult to see the top of something, uh, some heretical, uh, uh, heritage site, some building and so forth. So getting the aerial perspective is very important and that information can then be combined with the ground-based data. But when it gets really exciting for me anyway, is the fact that we can take the points and we can add an RGB colorization to each point. And this presents what, you looks, what looks like actually a photograph, but is not. What this is, is millions of individual points which have been extracted from the images but then each point is given an intensity value from the, the red, the green, and the blue spectrum, uh, band of the spectrum. So therefore, we have what we call an RGB, or a true colorized point cloud. And as you can see, even though it looks like an image, in fact, it's millions of uh, individual, dimensionally correct um, points. And in fact, this means that we can collect very large areas. So for instance, um, country, uh, maybe the twice the size of Switzerland, can be captured in just a few weeks. So an area of about 15% of Thailand could be imaged like this in just four weeks. So it gives you an idea of the efficiency and productivity of the systems that are possible. Now because the airborne cameras, the digital airborne cameras, also are able to record in other parts of the, the visible and, and near infrared spectrum, we can then colorize the data based on the near infrared band or the near infrared part of the spectrum and also in fact the red edge as they're now calling it in some areas. So this allows us to produce what we call a false color or color uh, IR image. But again, this is colorization of the points which have been collected but using the false color data from the IR part of the band, the near IR. This is uh, uh, another possibility which comes to fore. When we have the ability to capture the, the near infrared part of the spectrum, it is possible to produce what we call the normalized differential vegetation index, the NDVI. So in fact, Again, the same image, the same area where we have the points from the previous slides have now been colorized based on the NDVI. And this then shows you where, in essence, the uh, healthy or green vegetation is in that part. So you can distinguish very quickly where there's vegetation and where there's not. And where there's not tends to be modern uh, man-made types of uh, infrastructure. 
Now we turn our attention to LiDAR. So up until now, the examples I showed you were point clouds created from digital images from an aircraft. Now I'll show you some of the uh, output from the direct laser-based LiDAR systems which are flown, as I say, either in an aircraft or by helicopter. The use of uh, large numbers of laser points as a point cloud uh, from the air has been around for some time. Um, point clouds were generally very simplified. The points were color coded either by elevation or maybe by a geographical area. Very simple, one point fired uh, by the laser gave one return, one point on the ground or at least you hoped it was on the ground. Later, we were able to detect multiple returns from the same laser pulse. And this allowed us to get what we call the second return, the third return, and the fourth return, or whatever many returns that we get until we get the last return. And the importance of that is that the first return might be some of the laser energy hitting the top of a tree, or hitting a leaf, or a branch. But from that same laser pulse, you may also get some of that laser uh, energy hits the ground. So you get two returns from the same single laser pulse. And this is what we call multiple return uh, points. Later on, we looked at the intensity values. So this image here is not a grayscale, black and white, or panchromatic uh, camera image. It's actually a laser point cloud which has been colorized by the grayscale, the intensity values on this grayscale. And it looks like an image, but in actual fact it's many, many millions of uh, points on the ground. Next, we could colorize by other spectral data. The airborne LiDAR was twinned with a smaller medium format or even large format but by and large medium format camera which also recorded data in the, the red, the green, the blue and the near infrared and that image data was then used to be applied to the, the raw laser data so we could colorize by the spectral bands and in this case we get a very similar uh, color, uh, false color uh, look and feel to the actual images which came uh, earlier on in the show. So you can get false color, colorization of the point clouds or laser data. The development after that was instead of getting a single or two or three returns from each laser pulse, was then to digitize the full waveform. So all of the energy, all of the laser energy which was sent out in each pulse was recorded as it returned. Now generally that meant that the, you ended up with several peaks here where the highest amount of energy came back. And previously we would have called this the first return and maybe this one the last return. But with full digitization, we digitize the entire waveform of the laser energy as it's returned from the ground. And this meant that we could see a lot more resolution. We got a lot better detail on the ground from the LiDAR or laser uh, data. And the very latest technologies, which have been around from about 2010, is what they call a single photon uh, LiDAR. And instead of, uh, this means in essence, each photon of energy, believe it or not, each photon of energy that is emitted by the laser is measured as it returns back to the receiver on the sensor. And as you can imagine, this means that we have an enormous amount of resolution. And in fact, what it means is we can ha almost have uh, pixels. It's almost as if you've got an array, like in a digital camera, of so many thousand pixels by so many thousand pixels. So you've got the laser data within those, let's say, uh, pixels. And within those pixels, you have multiple returns. So you can see that the technology has been moving on all of these years to produce more and more data, points, uh, and resolution. And also, of course, the accuracies have improved over the years as well. So some of the typical applications from the image-based point clouds. 
This actually is Tokyo Narita Airport. It was taken by a large format camera and it has a GSD, a ground sample distance or pixel size on the ground of about 10 to 15 centimeters. So similar applications here. If you want to get the elevation or contours uh, of the ground and you need it in great detail, perhaps for some particular application that you have, you need to have what they call, as I said earlier, the terrain model. And to get the terrain model, you have to have sufficient data from either a, an SGM or a, an image or from an airborne LIDAR to be able to profile the terrain. At the same time, the same information can be used as, uh, to create what we call an orthophoto. An orthophoto is basically just a dimensionally correct image which you can measure from. So you can measure directions and you can measure uh, distances correctly on what looks like a normal photo, but it's been corrected to make it like a map. Okay. And that's an orthophoto. So here we see a raw surface model. So this is actually a, a digital surface model of a, a city, a, a town in, in Switzerland. And you can start to see how that you can see every individual building in this town, but you can also see the shape of the terrain. And if we were to extract all the buildings, then you would see the terrain model, which would just be the ground contour areas. We can also overlay the images onto it, so therefore you have what I would call a quasi 3D model of the uh, surface of the Earth. And here, basically what's been happened is the imagery from either the, the digital camera or sometimes the medium format camera has been draped over the surface model, which I just showed you. It's not a true 3D model because each individual building cannot be identified individually. There has to be another process to do that, but it is possible to do so in the firmware. Here we have another example. It's a, it's a little bit difficult to tell from the projector, but along the, the railway line here, you can actually see each rail of, on the railway line, and in fact, you can also see each sleeper. So the resolution, the quality of the information that's coming from the modern systems, of course, is getting higher and higher. This was five centimeter pixels. So on the ground, you could see five centimeter pixels in the computer. Some of the applications, and this might be more relevant for yourselves, are really specifically uh, best used using the airborne LiDAR. Rather than convert the images into point clouds, if you directly pick up the information with an airborne LiDAR, there are some advantages. One of the applications uh, is picking up uh, power lines. Uh, if there's a, a vegetation that is growing uh, underneath the power lines, this is very easily captured and measured. And every single conductor on the transmission line is captured individually. And depending on the temperature and so forth, the, the lines move up and down uh, above the terrain a small amount. This is a classical application for airborne LiDAR. I mentioned earlier on that the airborne LiDAR was, uh, it's possible to capture not only the uh, trees, the forest areas here, but you also capture the terrain underneath. And this is going to be relevant uh, when my colleague presents a little bit later on. So you have the ability to see the shape of the terrain, even though it may have heavy uh, or, or uh, medium to heavy um, forested or vegetated areas above it. And thus you can find things from the air you may not otherwise be able to find. Not only is airborne LiDAR used for getting terrain underneath uh, tree canopies, it also used for other environmental uh, applications such as biomass calculations. In many parts around the world, uh, people are wanting to know about carbon capture, carbon release, carbon trading even as a thing out there, believe it or not. So it is very important for people who own or manage forestry areas to know how much uh, biomass uh, they have in the system. And again, here in the green you can see the top of the canopies and underneath in the brown and the red you can see the terrain underneath. So here is uh, an example of the topography uh, of uh, an area with uh, the forested uh, trees on it, but by some manipulation in the computers, we could actually then take it away and directly get the terrain model. 
So here it is with, and here it is without. So we, in the computer system, we're able to, to take away everything that's above basically ground level and get a, a proper uh, terrain model, which we can then contour, map, measure, etc. Of course, using that is also very useful for uh, many other applications. Geology, for instance, it's important for geologists to be able to strip away the vegetation uh, above uh, the geological structures. And once they see the geological structures, then of course, they can then make uh, their um, analysis on what type of minerals are going to be there, what might be extracted and what might not. And of course, finally, the example which you'll hear about more is the use of airborne LIDAR in archaeology. This, of course, is a great tool to help find hidden treasures. Uh, this here is an example from uh, Anka Watt, which you'll hear more about, I believe, in a moment. And it shows clearly that what was visible from the air in a, only a photograph was not visible until we used airborne LIDAR. And here, we strip away the vegetation, trees, etc., and we can then truly see what is actually there underneath. And this is probably the most useful benefit uh, of the application for yourselves. So just to recap, the two technologies I've mentioned, one is creating the digital surface model from images, and the other is doing it directly from an airborne LIDAR. Um, historically, both of them, in fact, have been very difficult uh, due to computational uh, restrictions, but now computers are faster, data storage uh, is almost unlimited. It does use a lot of data, so you have to have plenty of storage spaces uh, on your computing system. And we're also able now to capture a lot more data. For instance, here we're collecting, collecting one million points per second. So as you fly on a one hour uh, flight in a helicopter or an aircraft, you can imagine the number of points that we're collecting at one million points a second. But when you do it with a, an airborne camera, you're collecting the equivalent of 9.6 million points per second. So for those of you that have used levels or total stations at digs, you're collecting one point every few seconds, every few minutes maybe. Here, we're collecting 9.6 million a second. And that is really the efficiency that the airborne um, systems bring to you. Okay, with that, thank you very much. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll be very happy to, to take them now. Otherwise, I'll hand over to my colleague.